Hi, welcome to the talk on SQL MySQL security for security audits. There's a lot of different types of security audits out there and they've grown and changed over the years. And it's hard in 40 minutes to get a uh, go into too much detail. So I'm going to kind of bounce around on a lot of different little things and try and focus on things that are specific to MySQL. Here's a little bit of my history. I've been doing databases for over 20 years now. Uh, I've worked on both sides. I've worked on, at companies uh, in the engineering group for databases. I've worked at large companies, uh, American Airlines, Sabre, Travel Web, Priceline, and uh, oh, that's it, sorry, where I've actually been the victim of audits. <laughs> and I've been with MySQL PS for the last little over two years now. I've worked and I've managed uh, databases running up to 14 terabytes in size. That would be the American Airlines Enterprise Data Warehouse and uh, in multiple different databases. The experiences that I've had or I've been victim of for security audits back before there was SOX and back before there was PCI, there were all kinds of audits you had to go through that really depended on uh, who you hired to do the audits. Uh, normally you had audits that were related to accounting and there was always security involved in that. If you were a big company like Sabre or American Airlines, you would be doing general security audits on your own as part of your books and as part of your due diligence as a corporation. Sarbanes-Oxley has made that even more formal and also allowed the people who do the audits to take the same audits they had before and charge more for them. Uh, PCI, which is the payment card industry data security standard, has come about by the credit card companies with all the huge growth in the last 15, 20 years in online credit card processing uh, to really keep their, their, the data of their customers, which are the credit card owners, secure. So what am I going to talk about? First, I'm going to just go through one slide with some keys to success for audits in general, but specifically for security audits, accounting audits, PCI audit, and so forth. Then what I'm going to do, because the PCI standard is on the web, it's available to everybody, it's a really good place to start for whatever type of auditing you're doing. If you don't have, uh, sometimes the accounting companies or people that come in and do your audits won't give you everything until just before they come in, but the PCI gives you a really good overview of the types of things you have to look at for security. So I'm going to take the, P the PCI standard, go through the kind of the high level details of that, and then focus on the parts that apply to MySQL. And at the end, just a few other thoughts on the topic. So what are some of the keys to success? The most important thing to a security audit is having somebody who has responsibility, ownership, and accountability for the security of your system. It's not something that you just assume people have. It has to be assigned to somebody, and that person has to take ownership of it. People have to have roles. No, not database roles, but roles in your corporation. And if one person, if you have a small company with three people, you can't take one person and say, You're, all you do is security. But one person has to be the point person for the other people to go to and say, hey, is this secure? One, there needs to be one person that the auditor can go to and that one person knows everything or has every, knows where the documentation is. You need to have procedures and policies. When the auditors come in, if you have the documentation laid out for all the things for them, and if that documentation is correct, what they'll do is they'll look at the documentation, they'll look at your procedures and policies, they'll find a few places to test. And if they all test out valid, they won't go into real depth and real detail. They'll trust you a bit more. 
If you don't have that documentation in place, or if you have the documentation in place, but they go to test it and look at it, and they find there's flaws in it, that it's not correct, they're going to look at everything in detail. So if you want to pass a security audit or any audit without a lot of heartache, you need to have your documentation, you need to have policies, you need to have all this stuff in place. Your procedures and policies need to cover things like adding new users, removing new users, uh, adding new applications. If you modify an application, you need to audit it yourself. You need to review its security impact. And the types of documentation you want to have is the roles of the people. What are your procedures and policies? Change and review logs. You want to document the fact that you actually reviewed this change to the application for security. And the person who owns the security signs off and says, yeah, this is good, we don't have to change anything, or we have to change this to make it secure. So you want a log of all security-related actions. Okay, so much for the general security stuff. Let's start talking about MySQL. Typical application in today's world, there's no such thing. But I put kind of a generic application up here of a medium-sized company about where you get to. Most applications nowadays are browser-based at the top. There's a web server. You could have the web server and app server on the same box. A small company, this is one server, one box, and browsers on a couple of clients or on a couple of people in the company. As you grow, it separates those would be separate servers. But the point I want to bring up with this, this diagram is just show the different contact points in a system where you can have problems with security. And we'll come back to this later. How many people have read the PCI requirements? How many people feel really comfortable with them? There's, there's high level requirements and lower level requirements in the PCI spec. And what I'm going through here is the high level, the first level of requirements. They all make, they're all, when you look at them, they make perfect sense. They're common sense requirements. Install and maintain a firewall configuration to protect cardholder data. Is the database behind a firewall? Yes. But does it being MySQL make much difference on the firewall? Not really. It's pretty standard. Do not use vendor supplied defaults for system passwords. Again, common, perfect common sense. Protect the stored cardholder data. Who can tell me what that means in PCI parlance? Card number. The card number. And operation and don't save the card swipe. Or the CDB2? That, that's a big part of it, but also if you store it on disk, encrypt it. Encrypt any transmissions of cardholder data across the network. It says open and public networks. So, going back to the documentation, policies, and process, use and regularly update your virus software. How many people have found a virus on their Linux server with the database on it? Oh. Install that virus software in your database box, too. Develop and maintain secure systems. Implement strong access control mechanisms. All of this is pretty straightforward. The stuff that's highlighted in yellow are things we're going to dive into a little more detail as to how it applies to MySQL. And the last few ones, regularly monitor and test networks. It's one of the harder things to do in MySQL. So the, the first point we'll talk about is do not use vendor supplied defaults. MySQL comes with several default accounts. If you install it, there's at least two anonymous accounts. In Linux, quite often after you install it, the root is not protected. And other people can do things on the accounts. How do you find what the accounts are on your system? Select user host password for MySQL user. We'll list all your users and we'll list the host thrown and the password. 
For more information about the default accounts, how to change them and how to set them, uh, there's a link here. But this is a fairly simple thing. I just want to cover it quickly because it doesn't make sense to go into too much detail for all of these, again, particularly considering the limited time we have. Protect stored cardholder data. This is probably the key and the most crucial thing. When you store cardholder data, and let me back up for a second. Again, I'm focusing on the, PS, the PCI, which focuses on credit card information and credit card related information. The same thing is true for different types of information that you store. So I'm using PCI as an example as a specific security audit, but it's also probably the one most people go through. But you can apply the same techniques I talk about here in relation to PCI for other audits. And the things that are defined and documented in PCI also apply pretty strongly to most other audits. You just need to transfer the data that's being protected from credit card data to whether it's your fin financial data, uh, whether it's medical data or so forth, you run into the same issues. So in the PCI spec, it says credit card numbers must be protected. That means they must be encrypted if they appear on storage. And storage is disk. It can be tape, a USB drive, a USB dongle, an email. I once at one company I worked at had uh, one of our vendors sent me a log of all the data they sent to us in XML format, and they left all the credit card numbers and the keys unencrypted in the email. Because they didn't realize it was in this, this 25 meg file they sent me. In the PCI standard, related customer data must also be protected if it's stored with your PAN, which is your credit card number. So it's not always just one thing that's important. Quite often, collections of things can be important. Yes? If you've got a credit card number and an account number in one table, and then it's you link it from the account number to the account number in the other table, does that mean uh, that the customer table needs to be encrypted as well? The individual columns need to be encrypted. If you have customer data with the uh, credit card number, the account number, those should all be encrypted also. And not necessarily by the same key. It's safer if it's not the same key. The best place to do encryption is always in the application. Why is the best place to do to encrypt data in the application? The first thing is it automatically encrypts the communications between the database and the application. If you're logging from that application, if you're doing any logs at the high level of the database, it's all encrypted. So it makes it very safe from the very first point you touch the data. One of the things that I've done and found very successful because I personally never want to have access to anybody's credit card information. I do not want to be there if somebody comes to the company and says so and so got the credit card access from you. I don't want to be on the list of guys who had access. So I do everything possible to keep any information that's sensitive away from my eyes. And one of the things I've done is use public private keys. Where the private key is on the application. And the only people who have access to the public key, to the, I'm sorry, the public key is on the application. And the only people who have access to the private key are people in the accounting office. And I put a little stored procedure there where they, where they can type it in, in the stored procedure to get the value back, but I don't know it, so I cannot get, that, get those values. And so what are we talking about here? In the architecture, this whole picture I talked about before, we're talking about just the data files and the app servers. And of course, the database sits through this and doesn't have any problems because all the data get, the, gets to it is encrypted if it's encrypted in the application. 
Now, if you have to use MySQL encryption functions, be very careful, particularly with your logs. Do not use binary logs prior to 5.1. Well, that's easy to say. I need, I need to do the encryption in MySQL, and I want to replicate. Well, how do I get around that? I'll show you why this is a problem in the next slide. One way to get around that is to optionally encrypt the disk using that has your bin log on it, actually use an encrypted file system. And there are some allowances in the PCI standard to harden the database server even more. In 5.1 and after, you can use row-based replication. Row-based replication sends the raw data after it's encrypted. So if you have row-based replication on, what's written to the bin log is already encrypted. If you turn on the general query log and you're, well, let's just go to the next slide. If you're using MySQL encryption, you're doing something like insert into the table values, AES encrypt, password, and the key to encrypt that password or credit card number. If you do that in the binary log and you run SQL bin log on it, this is what's going to come out. So you've effectively put both what you're trying to protect and the key to access it on the disk. Same thing with the general query log. If you have the general query log turned on while you're doing this or you're monitoring your system, again, you violate security, you put stuff on the disk that's not allowed to be on the disk. So, using row-based replication gets it out of the bin log. Do not turn on the general query log or be very, not on your production system. Be very careful with the slow query log. Or if you do turn on the general query log, what's the solution for it? You write it to an encrypted file system. And you also, have not, you also don't want to log at an application or between the DB and the app in this case. So the, the vulnerabilities we just talked about are if you're encrypting at the database level, the key, the data can be unencrypted here, plus if you're, say, using Java and turn on the logging on the Java connector, you can have unencrypted data stuck in it. If you're logging from your apps, you can have unencrypted data in it. And just so you remember, and it's not really MySQL specific, there are ways to log it at the web server. I've seen people who have had credit card numbers in their web logs. So it, it sounds like a really silly thing to do, but it's something to check. So public pre encryption makes it really easy to encrypt it in the application. But it's not practical for all applications. Sometimes you need to get the value back. In that case, public-private key isn't really going to work if the application needs to both encrypt it and return it and look at it. Uh, with credit card numbers, quite often what I've done is do what is public-private key, also one-way encryption of it, so I could re-encrypt the credit card number and compare the two and then maybe save the last four in some low-level encrypted very mi minorly and get that back and forth so that you can get those information without fully decrypting the credit card number. <laughs> On the database itself, and this is general security stuff, and I'm going to be sprinkling this throughout the presentation. In MySQL, this seems to be the case more often than not, that people give people higher levels of privilege than they should. Always give the application, the users, the developers, only the very minimal privileges they need to get to the data if you have sensitive data on that server. And you need to document what those policies and procedures are. That's going to be part of the security audit. The PCI is a great source of information of how to do that. The, the PCI specs. So have a documented policy, follow it, 
log the security events when you add a user, when you remove a user, when you change the level of privilege of a user. Make a little note and stick it somewhere. And manage the security change. So here's another little gotcha in my SQL. If you do a grant, we already looked at the general query log, and we looked at the bin log, so that's no surprise that if you do a grant, you're, you're in the MySQL command line tool. Obviously, it's going to go there. But how many people know and use the MySQL history file? If you're using the MySQL command line tool, it creates a history file in your home directory. And it creates it with your permissions, not super user or, or something else, your own personal permissions. So if you go in and you do a grant or you do another database command, it's going into your history file. And you put passwords, you, do set, you set things there, it goes into that file. So another vulnerability that you would need to be aware of. So how do you keep that from happening? And one way to solve this, there's a whole set of things, like any security issue, it's not resolved by one simple thing. There's a set of policies and a set of things you have to do. In MySQL, there's no really super secure way to set the passwords that follows everything completely. So you have to have a policy that defines what you do so that it does fit their requirements. If you use the MySQL admin tool to set your password, you have to type the passwords in on the command line. However, it uses the internal algorithm that we use to create the encrypted password so that when it writes it to the database, what you get is this. It's already encrypted in the logs. But it brings up another issue, which is if you put the password on the, on the command line, you've got history. You've got your bash history. So you can disable bash history. <laughs> How many people really ever want to disable their bash history? <laughs> <laughs> or you can flush your bash history after you do something like this. So never use MySQL minus U user with your password on the command line. I don't put it in your default my.conf in your local directory for, for your uh, connection tools because you're putting the password on a disk where people can get it, where it's a little bit more hackable than the root of the system. So as a DBA, as a security administrator, what do you do to check this? Well, write scripts that go through all your users and look at their bash histories for calls to MySQL admin, MySQL, or different things where a password could appear. Run those every night to check and make sure that there's nothing in the history. You can do the same thing with it. If you have the bin log on and you're using this mechanism, you can run, it, run scripts that run through the bin log and look for unencrypted passwords. So I added batch history to the stuff we're looking at. <laughs> SQL injection is pretty common. It's discussed out there a lot. I don't really think it, it's common to all databases. It's not specific for MySQL. So I'm not going to talk about it and a lot of those things that aren't specific to MySQL, but it's something you have to be aware of and whoever the security person is needs to study those kinds of things. Yeah, we had a, I, I said her name earlier today, we had a, a person, I think it was at American Airlines, her name was Edna Null, last name N-U-L-L. -L. And she wondered why she didn't get paid the first few months. Well, <laughs> bad database design. So 
how do you protect your card holder data in terms of, or I'm sorry, one way to protect yourself from SQL injection and to protect your database from any intrusion <coughs> is to use stored procedures. Write a stored procedure for everything that comes from outside the firewall. Give the account that those applications have only permission to run the stored procedures. Then internally set the permission of the stored procedures to whatever they need to perform their function. What you end up with is something that's totally impervious to SQL injection. If somebody breaks into your app server, the only thing they can do is run those stored procedures. They can do nothing that you don't have a stored procedure for. Plus, your application will probably run a lot faster. Another thing people sometimes forget about is what's the security app, the security privilege of applications that are monitoring your database. I've been into so many places where you look at cacti or something running and it's, oh, it's root. Make sure that your monitoring tools, that the accounts you're using to monitor the database are set to the very lowest level of privilege possible for whatever they're doing. I know it's a mantra, I keep saying it again and again, but you need to do it for every single account. And every time a new account is added, you need to look at it. So, Protect your encrypted data. Remember, the more one has, the easier it is to crack. So don't just encrypt it and say, okay, it's fine, I've encrypted all my credit card numbers, I can throw them out on the internet. If a cracker has enough data, they can crack anything. So still protect it, even though it's encrypted. Keep it physically safe. Don't let everybody in the company have access to it. Please keep it away from me, for sure. I don't want to know about it. Encrypting data during the transmission is pretty straightforward. Note the clause that says, Encrypted open public networks. Unless you have a really, really robust firewall, firewall DMZ architecture, encrypted anyways in, some, in your internal networks. If it has unencrypted credit card data in it, in your transmissions, encrypt it no matter how deep it is in your network. One thing I really love to have in my data centers is a dedicated network between the application and the database. Direct connections that do nothing but go from that app server to the database it needs to connect to. So there's no other way to get through that gateway. And the accounts only work for that set of applications. You still want a firewall there. It's less needful than if you have a big wide gateway that a whole bunch of things are coming through, but it's still a good thing to have a firewall. Why is it a good thing to have a firewall? To monitor and catch anything that gets through and somebody starts scanning that. <laughs> I was waiting for you to speak up on that. If you do encryption in the application, it's not 100% necessary to encrypt your transmitted data. It's still a good idea, but in terms of for auditing, if you've got good hard encryption on the data, as soon as it comes into the application and then it's trans transmitted that way, it's not as big a deal because it's already encrypted and protected. When I say data, I don't, ju I don't just mean the credit card number, I mean the associated the rest of the data, the name, the address, the other things that are used as part of that. And I guess it, it should go without saying that there are parts of the credit card data that you cannot stick on disk ever. The little three-letter authorization code. 
the, the other one, I forget the name of it, but there are things like that that never can be written to disk. And it's amazing sometimes what you find in the session data on a browser. So, so <laughs> the places where I've worked, I've always just kind of opened the code in the browser to see what's there, even though it's not my job, because sometimes people forget, and suddenly there's a little session variable. Hmm. So with MySQL, you can use SSL connections. It's fairly easy to, to set up and configure. It works pretty well. So there's my little flashing diagram of all the places that you, that you need to worry about in terms of security so far. And the app servers were supposed to be read. But Item number six in PCI says develop and maintain secure systems and applications. That's probably a wide spectrum of things. I'm going to focus a little bit more on the maintain part, because the maintain part has to do with having a regular process for identifying needed security patches and applying them. MySQL has a defined security policy. Uh, it's not totally, if you read that, the, the document by Kai up there on security vulnerabilities and how MySQL handles them, uh, talking about everything there is longer than this presentation, but Kai does a great job. And there's uh, another link here on the MySQL wiki that describes particular security uh, vulnerabilities and how they've been fixed, what have and what haven't. Separate the roles as much as possible. And the reason this is on this slide, it sounds like a personnel issue, but when I say the roles of the applications, when you design your applications, make sure that an application, the database, or the data warehouse reporting tool, doesn't necessarily have the, you know, can't write to the database. Give it only the, again, this is the mantra, give everything only the very minimum security requirement it needs, privilege it needs to perform its function. When you're developing code, modifying code, or dropping code, always perform a security review. When you add code, obviously you have to review it for security. If you change just a few lines of code, you should still look at it from the security perspective and just say, doesn't it write it with the log? It was reviewed. Obviously, when you drop code, you need to find all the accounts that were associated with that if there were specific codes for that application, connections to the database, and drop those accounts. And when you do architect, watch for other applications related to the database. For instance, uh, Memcache. How many people use Memcache? How secure is Memcache? <laughs> Not at all. Zero to nada. If you're using memcache, you definitely want to encrypt. And anything that is secure actually gets cached in it, encrypt at the application, and encrypt very well. Section 8 of PCI talks about assigning a unique ID to each person with computer access and how to manage what are valid passwords and how to manage them. MySQL has no built-in help for you with this. However, it is a database, and it stores all this stuff in the database. And you can use the data that's there to build scripts, stored procedures, whatever you want to do to do this in MySQL. Aging passwords. PCI requires that passwords change every 90 days. In MySQL, you can't say the password age is 90 days, but you can write a stored procedure and run it every midnight that stores the encrypted passwords in another table and the date and looks to see if they've changed in 90 days. And maybe 15 days before 90 days, start sending emails to the guy, hey, change your passwords. So you can implement all this in stored procedures and scripts. 
PCI also requires that you don't reuse the same password, the last four passwords. Again, it's a database. Store the last four encrypted passwords in a table. Have a script that checks that. Password quality checking. That's a lot, a lot harder to do. One, you have to have a policy for it, and it has to be documented. Say you don't use common words. The easiest way to do it is you can go on the web and find common passwords. Huge, huge list of them. There are tools that will allow you to then take those, run them through MySQL, and compare and, see, and check for vulnerabilities that way. It's a hard way to do it. Uh, I wish there was a better solution to that one, but you have that one you really have to have the policy and force people to follow it. What I do for passwords in everything is I use passwords like this guy right here. That's, that's why those of you who were here early were watching me type in to try and get in my laptop. And it was like on the fourth try before I finally got it right, and I've had the same password for a lot more than 90 days on, that I've been using. But I come up with long phrases like this. I love to work on databases for MySQL, and I think C++ is great. I'll, I'll remember those. So I love to work on databases for MySQL, and I think C++ is great. <laughs> Hack that bugger. <laughs> Now, we talked a minute ago, there is a solution for this. Remember, we looked at MySQL admin and the output from MySQL admin that went into the log files, it had the password already encrypted. The function that takes a password and encrypts it is available if you link to this, the MySQL libraries to build an application. So you can write an application that hides the password as the person types it in, encrypts it that way and writes it to the database and also performs these checks. It's a fairly easy C application or Perl or a lot of different things you could write it in. If you really want to enforce this mechanically, you need to write a little application to take care of it. There is a Perl tool out there. Actually, it comes with MySQL. MySQL set password, it doesn't do that. Uh, MySQL administrator, if you change the password there, what you get is a set password unencrypted in the log files. I'm going to report that and hopefully we'll get it fixed. Another place where MySQL is really difficult to work with is track and monitor all access to network resources and cardholder data. The and cardholder data, of course, is the, the MySQL part of the problem. The good news is there's help coming in 6.0. In 6.0, there's a plug-in logging interface. The only plug-in available for it in 6.0 that we're going to provide is a fairly simple one. However, it's a whole new world for consultants and people out there who want to add plugins. It's a fairly simple interface to code and program to, and I expect to see, you know, by the time 6.0 gets out there, more comprehensive logging available in MySQL. If not from us, then from another third party out there. One thing you can do, or several things you can do, is you can create scripts to monitor error log for failed logins and disable accounts based on failures. The PCI standard says if somebody fails more than six times, you want to lock them out. You can have a script that runs every couple minutes, yeah. looks at the error log, and if it finds one account, has been unsuccessful without a successful login, it disables that account. You should be, if you're in a secure environment, you should be parsing that error log and looking at that error log regularly in any case. For people trying to, there, there's things where they can try and hack multiple users and stuff, it'll show up in that error log. And you can use triggers to monitor inserts, updates, and deletes. It's not the optimal solution. You can use the logging. If you turn on general logging to do this, then you have the problem we talked about earlier. All the, um, if you're encrypting in the database, if everything that comes in is encrypted from the, from the application, 
And then all you're left with is the passwords being set. If you have the application we talked about, if you write the little application that always sets them with the value, then you can turn on your general log and you can monitor inserts, updates, deletes, and selects from the general log. But you have to have the layers of protection. You need to make sure that you don't get uh, unencrypted data in the general log, so it's all encrypted before it gets to the database. You need to make sure that when you're adding passwords or changing passwords, the people are encrypting the password first. And you can actually encrypt the password first at the command line in MySQL if you want to. You can, uh, you can get the encrypted thing using the select password function of it. And no, that still goes to the log. So it's, if you have the, the function we talked about earlier, uh, you write a little C program or full script or something that allows you to put in the passwords or you change the passwords with uh, MySQL admin tool like we talked about earlier, then you could turn on the general log and you can use it to monitor inserts, updates, and deletes. So go back. Three things you need to do. Encrypt in the application. Have a policy that requires you use MySQL admin the way we talked about before. And then you can use the uh, general log to monitor inserts, updates, and deletes. Another thing, what I actually prefer to do, is use stored procedures with built-in logging to access individual credit card data. If you have secure data and only a very and you're using the public private keys I talked about, you can write stored procedures that the people who have the private keys can use to get to that data. The stored procedures then log every access. So you just, in the code of the stored procedure, you write to a table every time it's run with who's running it, the time of day, and what they're going to look at. Your kind of account number, not the sensitive data. So I'm going to kind of go back and review some of the things we talked about. Does, does anybody want to talk about the stuff I kind of mumbled through just just a while ago. Are there questions with it? We're almost done. We can ask questions afterwards if you want. What are the right reasons for security vulnerability? Probably the primary reason is bad policies or processes. You can say bad design. Well, yeah, you can have bad, bad design, but if you had a security policy that said it was security reviewed, then that should fix the design. So the normal one reasons for vulnerabilities is you don't have good policies and, pra and processes in place to enforce security. Then bad design. Bad software configuration. You haven't set up software correctly. Software flaws. <coughs> software has a, a flaw in it where people can exploit it and get into it, or lets inept people go in and do silly things. And probably there's more data lost and more confusion cost by inept people doing something silly, and then you don't know if somebody stole the credit card numbers or if somebody had deleted them because he doesn't want to tell you about it. What are the different classes of vulnerabilities? Invalid access, hackers, corrupt, or inept employees. It's probably in the wrong order. Uh, data in motion. We talked about the, the network connection as data moves around. And static data. Disk storage, backups, logs. Joe's laptop that he took home with all the IRS numbers. Uh, the credit card numbers from the place in Arizona that got some guy had on the laptop that was stolen on an air, stolen at an airport. So it's something there's this whole set of layers you have to have in place. 
And the layers you need to have in place need to be documented. You need to have policies that maintain those layers. And you need to have documentation that shows you've enforced your policies to maintain those layers as you go forward. No, no happy ending in security. It just goes on and on and on. <laughs> Yes? I had a PCI auditor tell me that MySQL out of the box was inherently non-PCI compliant. Is that true or is it your, the changes you suggest can you get around? You can get around. The, the, the thing about auditors is they range, there's a, <laughs> I had an auditor from a big three hit me about five years ago as a kid right out of school, didn't have a clue about anything. Uh, we then fired that company for other reasons and then brought in a new accounting firm to do the audit and we got somebody who'd been there for like 45 years and you couldn't tell them a thing, which was like the other far end of the spectrum. So be their friend, have a lot of patience. It, there's a whole wide range of, of people who do the auditing and just like good programmers and bad programmers, the thing is to have patience have your documentation in hand. For most of the things in the PCI, uh, for instance, the data protection, there's an addendum you can go down and look in, and if you apply those rules, then you don't quite need data protected at the same level. Yes? MD5 encryption is one that uh, I got started with. I like the idea, but I've been told it's not secure anymore. There's better ones now. Like what? Soft. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. In fact, if you want to be FITS compliant, MD5 is allowed. Right. FITS 140-2. The reason it's really important to have a person who is your security dude or do that is to make sure that there's one person who is responsible for keeping track of these things. One person, you have to be able to, go, to know who to go to and say, is this algorithm okay to use? If you, get, if you look over the developer and decide and say, hey, can I use MD5? Probably say, sure, fine, looks good to me. But if you have the policies in place and if you have somebody who has the role of security being the security person, then that person can say, well, no, it's not because of this I read, or let me go research and find out. But the more important thing is, if you're doing security reviews as part of a change, when you make that change where you're changing the code where you have to start using MD5 or whatever, that's part of your security review. So they shouldn't have to decide to come look for you. As part of every change, there should be a security review. Yes? Security review. Review, do you expect somebody to go through each line of the code, or does it change, or what? It depends. You need to, the, the security person should look at what the change is, and they should understand what's going on enough to say, yeah, I've got to look at this in more detail, or say, no, it's, I don't think there's an issue here. Because it, it really depends on what's going on. Yes? I couldn't answer that one. I haven't done the DOD one. What's your uh, preferred method for authenticating bad jobs, like things that are not the front, and then you know, here, don't put passwords in clear text on mm -hmm. systems, but I mean, the MySQL server has no inherent way of differentiating something fired up or crime path than it does from a workstation. <laughs> Sometimes you can't avoid, I mean I can sit here and put on my security hat and I've had security auditors come in and say you cannot, you know, put a password anywhere on disk, period, no matter what. There are times where you have to have it unless you want somebody to wake up every time at midnight one of the things you can do is have a script that runs all the time 
that does this and you type in your passwords as the script starts up, uh, that will get you around some level of auditors who, who absolutely insist on that. But as we all know, it's possible to get into the program code if you have the high enough level, I mean, if you have access to the server at the right level, and you can pull that out just as well as you can pull it out on disk. Maybe, maybe it's a little harder to find it, but it's findable there. Uh, but that's usually what I go for. If the audit firm I'm dealing with insists nothing can be on disk, I'll write a, a C application usually that you type in your passwords when you start it up, it keeps it in memory, and then it kicks off the things. If you do have to have, there are cases where you absolutely, it just doesn't make sense to do it any other way but to keep it in a file on disk. You've got to have an account that's only for that. It can only do the minimal stuff that that can do, and you want to protect that in some way. Uh, maybe in the application have some minimal encryption so it's not really stored unencrypted, but yeah, they have to hack the application to find out what the encryption model is. So you've got yet another layer on it. Do you have any opinions on IC Verify and PC Chart? They're pretty common in my industry. I don't have an opinion on them. I don't have enough experience with them to, to have a formal opinion. Anything else? Yes? Now, what about replication? Because the replication stored that master info in a clear text. Yes. <laughs> what are, how do you handle that? Uh, what are you using replication for? For HA or for uh, scaling? High availability. Use DRDB instead. Would you recommend or would you consider renaming the root account to another thing? I certainly would. Unfortunately, I'm not the one who would make the... Uh, okay, you're talking about you're in the... Uh, I'm talking I, about dropping root yeah. and creating another user. I don't know. I would have to think about that more. I, I certainly think that Almost no one should get root privilege. I also think that we MySQL needs to do some, I mean, we have 30 security privileges as there are. I think there's some more work that needs to be done, and I know we're working on it. But that doesn't mean that you can't pass PCI security audits with MySQL, because you certainly can. But as, as the auditor said, out of the box, it may not pass a PCI audit. But if you do the things I talked about up here, wrap different things around it, the layers of protection, to fix the vulnerabilities, you can pass a PCI audit. Ha has anybody here passed a PCI audit with MySQL? No. It's doable. Do you have to add things like this, or were they just fine with the basic stuff? Once again, you know, as, as you said uh, before, you know, your, your auditor is your friend. Yep. Take them to the pub, show them around. <laughs> you know, realistically, you know, there, there are some definite, uh, you know, big, big buyers that they're going to look for. Um, you know, and as they set out the box, it's, it won't pass because it's using a default password. Anything you use out of the box will pass. We'll have to at least some changes to it. Now, this isn't really a technical point, but um, one strategy I found over the years that worked well with auditors is, by the way, are there any auditors in the room? <laughs> 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 is uh, sort of honey them or like tossing them a couple of red herrings, like intentionally leave a couple of little things in them to find because they're not going to they're not going to go to whoever paid them and say, no, everything's fine. They're going to write up something. So they will see what they need to do. The that's probably a good strategy. I probably wouldn't recommend using it because there's much worse things that can happen to your company because of security than failing a security audit. And the purpose of the security audit is to make your system secure because you don't want to be the one up there on Slash that, that says 100,000 credit card numbers appear on the web. 
So that, that, that's the end of a company when that happens. Do you have any suggestions for putting the fear of God or auditors into customers who have the attitude, we love everybody and everybody loves us, they would, nobody would hurt us? Uh, you need to have in the contract security clauses that cost people money. For people, for the roles, people who have security role need to have that in their bonus as part of whether how they do, how you do in the audit, security validations and things like that need to impact your bottom line. Because there's nothing, there's almost nothing other than really having a crappy business model that can kill you faster than, you know, bad security that gets hacked. I find uh, that a little public humiliation uh, sometimes helps bring that report. Uh, you know, if you run a password audit and ask mm -hmm. for, you know, a meeting, department, or whatever, say, hi, we'd yeah. like to change your password from your username to something more secure. Yes. You know, a lot of people will go, oh, that's me. That's me. Yeah. I think that's about all I got time for. Thank you very much. I enjoyed this. <laughs>